School of Social Policy and Practice, also known as SP2. I'm delighted to welcome you back to this virtual opening of the 2024-2025 Speaker Series, Conversations About Race, Equity, and Justice with Experts on Social Policy and Practice. The university's recently launched strategic framework called In Principle and Practice identifies four great challenges of our time, climate, health, data, and democracy. Here, SB2 is committed to leaning on these leading on these challenges through research and practice of our faculty, staff, students, and alumni across the fields of social work, social welfare, social policy, and nonprofit leadership. This year's speaker series will focus on these great challenges. Ben Jealous will host today's program, which is going to be on democracy, a conversation about civic engagement, activism, and the political process. Ben is a professor of practice at the Annenberg School for Communication and here at SP2, and he is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Penn Carey Law School. He's the former national president and CEO of the NAACP and former Democratic nominee for governor of Maryland. Ben now serves as the executive director of the Sierra Club. Ben has an unwavering commitment to social change and social justice that is in perfect alignment with SP2's mission. When he was selected to head the NAACP at the age of 35, he became the organization's youngest ever national leader. His family's strong community activism dates back generations, and we're very proud of his SP2 connection, which traces back decades to his late beloved grandmother, who was an SP2 alumna. We're delighted to host this conversation today as we support the university's strategic framework and lead on great challenges of our time. And now I'm honored to introduce our host, Ben Jealous. Go ahead, thank Ben. You. Thank you, Sally. And, and I'm really excited for our first conversation of this academic year. Uh, and I know my grandma's smiling and having because my daughters just started at Penn uh, with the intention of doing a five-year BA MSW uh, with SP2. Um, and today's conversation, y'all, I'm really excited about because it involves two of my favorite colleagues uh, in the movement, uh, and one of my favorite colleagues, and in addition to Sally and, and uh, the leadership of SP2. Um, but before we get into that, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions during the event, please use the Q&A tab to submit them. Uh, my colleague, and my screen went black, but I guess we can just, um, anyways, uh, my colleague, Caitlin Benny and I will be going through your questions and just use the Q&A tab to submit them. And again, I'm excited to host this series. Uh, today, we have two great speakers joining us. Um, one is my colleague here at SP2, the founding executive director of SP2 Center for High Impact Philanthropy, Kat Broskana. Uh, and uh, she's, fac she's faculty and co-director of the High Impact Philanthropy Academy. Um, she founded that academy as a collaboration between the SB2 uh, and the uh, and graduates of the Wharton School. And the Center for High Impact Philanthropy is the premier source of knowledge and education on how philanthropy can do more good in the world. Um, somebody used to run a foundation. You know, there is a lot to be a lot of good that needs to be done, and yet a lot of people still give money to the opera. So I'm grateful for Kat for inspiring people of ways to give money that is fulfilling and not just putting on another great opera. Um, Virginia Case Solomon uh, is a nationally recognized leader, one of the great leaders in our country of social justice organizations. She is president and CEO of Common Cause, a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to upholding the core values of American democracy. Prior to joining Common Cause, she served as CEO of the League of w Women Voters. She also served as COO of CASA, which is a great group based in Maryland, works in multiple states, right at the forefront of the immigrant rights movement. And I couldn't really think of more balanced or better 
conversation to be having about the future of our democracy. And for a moment, I just want to share something that we were talking about when we were coming on here about sort of where we are in this historic moment that we're in. Why is it that we um, find ourselves in a place where, where democracy itself is something that is controversial or that we're having to fight to maintain in this country? And as somebody who on both sides of the family, the white side and the black side, goes back about 400 years, our family, uh, we descend from Thomas Jefferson's grandma on one side and some of the earliest settlers of Virginia and on the other side from the founders of Salem, Massachusetts. And that side knows that we came here actually 400 years ago this year, 1624. I mean, slavery is kind of vague, but it gets back to around the same time. You know, we are living through a specific historical epoch in our country, which is the, the decades when white Americans realize and then be, that they're about to become and then become one of all the other minorities in this country. Uh, and that will happen before we get to the midpoint of this century. And my grandmother, who you know, graduated with her, with her master's in social work in 53 at SP2 and who led the war in poverty, implementation for the state of Maryland and who was a soldier in the civil rights movement here in Maryland. Um, you know, when she was at the end of her life, she's about 104 years old, we had a conversation about where we're at. And there were two things. One was that, you know, she was always very clear that it wasn't enough to just look at the history of discriminating against voters based on gender or the history of discriminating against voters based on race. But you also, also had to remember just the kind of hardcore antipathy for poor people amongst the American ruling elite that rendered all men who did not own property, all white men who did not own property without the vote until the 1840s. And so there has been a fight to expand American democracy literally to almost all of us, call it the 99% who are women, people of color, or white men who don't own property. Uh, maybe the 95% um, from the very beginning in this, in this democracy. The other is that um, while it's easy to kind of point out the racists, and Caitlin, if you could check, for some reason, the, the main screen, I'm just seeing Dean Sally Bachman's name. So I'm not sure if that's the experience that our viewers are having. But you know, the other thing she would say is that um, uh, we have to recognize like just the decades that we're going through and the decades that we're that we're going through in this country um is this time when whites are becoming a minority too and you don't have to be racist to be white and unsettled by that you just have to be responding to a sense of the loss of agency i mean you know I look at people like my favorite uncle lives up in maine and He's not racist. He stood by my dad when he married my mom. He's very courageous on matters of race. Um, but he was also born into an America where white men chose who was president. And as a white guy, he's lived through, you know, the presidents who white men vote for uh, because their vote is determinative. You know, if the majority of vote, my, white men vote for that candidate, they become president. That was true all the way through Ronald Reagan to a world where you also needed women's votes and you also need a black folks folks and now even donald trump doesn't get elected without like a lot of michigan's you know a lot of uh islamic voters in a lot of muslim voters in in michigan voting for, or a lot of venezuelan voters in southern florida and it's just a lot of change in one lifetime and so that's what we're kind of in right now we're in this period where whites are becoming a minority too. And we're in one of the periods in American history where we have to vote to either maintain or expand our democracy to ultimately trying to get to the great ideal that we all subscribe to, we all uphold. And we act on this country has always been about, but man, when you look at the history, it's hard to really find a time when everybody's vote was protected. And so Kat and Virginia, to pull you guys in, I'm really excited about our conversation and can you really, can you both start just by giving your vision, your definition of what are the components of a strong democracy? Like what is the ideal that, that our country has claimed that it's all about, but truly been aspiring to for centuries and never quite meeting? Yeah. So um, 
I'll, I'll start because I want to pick up on this theme of change. I mean, what do we know about change? It is inevitable and often scary. And, and that was one of the reasons why our team actually posed the question you just asked me in Virginia, which is, so what actually is democracy? What is a strong democracy? And um, we looked at, there have always been tons of frameworks that people have used to understand the strengths or weaknesses of a particular democracy, whether in US or the state of democracy around the world. And um, what was interesting is we found four components that almost all those frameworks alluded to. And, that, and one that many did sort of overlooked, but I think is, is part of why this current moment in time is feeling so fragile and charged. The four were um, exactly as you said, Ben, citizens feel empowered. All citizens feel empowered that because citizens are the principal, individuals are the principal actors in a democracy. That's what's kind of revolutionary about a democracy. It's, it's government by the people. The second is fair processes. Probably the most visible one is voting. And, and you know, people have um, questioned the trustworthiness of that process, but there are other processes too, just how even um, issues get raised, um, the checks and balances that we all need, fair processes, empowered citizens. The third is responsive policy that um, those who are setting policy, who are charged with serving the people, that those policies reflect the common good. The fourth is information and communications, right? None of this will work if everybody doesn't have access to timely, relevant information that they trust. So those were the four that we found across all these um, frameworks, empowered citizens, fair processes, responsive policy, information and communication. But the one that was often overlooked and is both the result of all those good things and also um, make sure those good things happen is social cohesion. That there is a common sense of a shared purpose that there is a um it's it's sort of captured in that phrase we the people right that that is a vision of a kind of social coherence and what can happen is you could have a lot of efforts in the other four and frankly they can sometimes actually lead to division if you don't also have an eye to that social cohesion element so that's what we found um when there were all five elements attended to, you tended to see stronger democracy. You know, it's interesting that you talk about social cohesion and even in general, I think one of the things that, you know, I've been having this discussion a lot lately with folks and I'm sorry, the landscaper has decided that they're gonna start doing the lawn outside. You can't so hear you there can. is background noise, I do apologize. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, as we think about this and we think about democracy as a whole, there's also an important thing that we need to, I think, name. Um, and that is, we weren't truly, our, we're, our democracy is much younger in reality than what we believe it to be. And what I mean by that is until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we weren't truly a full democracy because everybody wasn't able to. And with all the flaws that have existed since then. But think about how young our democracy is in this moment. And so we are going back as people were able to gain more, we were able to see more progress. There was more social cohesion. We started to see so much progress throughout the 70s, 80s, despite the flaws, again, um, 90s. And what you saw was, especially over the past few years, um, as people's voting rights have started to roll back, as we've seen decisions like removal of preclearance, Shelby V. Holder, all of these things, the Voting Rights Act just being pretty much gutted completely. Um, as we see the decline of these rights, we're also seeing a regression in our democracy. And I think none of that is unintentional. And I think that there are people, going back to what you said, Ben, that um, 
race still continues to play a major role in this, in, in, in democracy and who the country was built for. And there is a power grab that is happening among some to maintain and contain power to an entitlement among some to hold that power. And so I think um, we can't look at this as just accidental what we're seeing. Some of this has been very strategically planned um, because it is happening through the deterioration of laws, the removal of very basic rights that people once had. You look at even things like when we, we talk about the, um, the decision around Roe, what has happened to women and their ability to have bodily autonomy has done great damage in a very short period of time in relegating women back to this second class citizenship, not having ownership over their own self, their own bodies. And so um, when we talk about a healthy democracy as a whole, I think we need to think about what has existed and what has worked for our country. And then when those rights are removed, how we see it coincide with the deterioration of, uh, of, of, of our ability to interact with one another as, a, as, as citizens in this country, as people who live in this country. And so I think it's really a complicated time. And I think that there's so much more to it um, than we could actually ever get through in this conversation. But I do think that when we think about a healthy democracy, we have to look at where we've seen our country be healthy in the past. And then not only how do we get back to that, but go beyond that. Um, and then figure out what are the things that have lined up that is not just very, it's not very specific. You can't say that it's very linear, so to speak, or it's very hard to connect um, the dots if you're not really paying attention because you look at the attacks on journalism, you see what the rise of social media, you see what's happening again around economic issues, the rise again of unions, which is something that I'm very hopeful about, even though sometimes it can be really difficult if you have an organization that you run that has a union. But it's important um, for people to feel as though their work is valued and matters. And so all of these things, I think, when we think about a healthy democracy, it is much more complex than just the practice of voting or passing laws. Um, it is really about people in their everyday lives and how they interact with the laws that exist and how they feel be, that they feel feel or see themselves being seen in this country. Yeah, and you know, I think there's the other thing is that we've got to also just deal with the class aspect. You know, when you I did my graduate work in, at Oxford in England, and it's interesting because you, 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 you like wake up in England and you're like, wow, this is like America, but not, right? Like you look the wrong way for the car and then your head almost gets knocked off by the bus, you know, like you're just kind of in this upside down <laughs> world. And, and the, um, you know, on the one hand on race, they were uh, in a very different place than us. Um, there were a lot of white women with black kids and it didn't seem nobody was staring at them, pushing them down the street where, you know, I was once the black kid with the white dad who everybody stared at. And you still see that happen in this country, um, especially when it's white women over there. There were you know, white women and black men were having kids and nobody seemed to be worried about it. On the other hand, uh, it was clear they would pretend like they didn't have any race issues and they and they clearly did. Uh, there were all sorts of racially driven hate crimes, and, and it just showed that whether it was the Pakistani community or it was the black uh, community, they had a real issue. Um, but they were very open about having class issues. And in our country, we uh, are very open about having race issues. We try to pretend like we don't have class issues. And yet a lot of the toxicity in our politics tracks with... Uh, the closing down of 65,000 factories in this country over the last 30 years. You know, you can't explain Brexit uh, without the deindustrialization of the UK. And you really can't explain the toxicity in American politics today without NAFTA and what it created, which was shutting down 65,000 factories. And so, you know, we're, we're dealing with that and this change where whites are feeling like they are, uh, just becoming less relevant politically, you know, not dominant, but want part of a coalition, if you will. And, and that's a lot of change in a democracy at that one time. There, uh, we have a question, I'm just gonna pop to that and, and then we'll, we, we got some other set questions, but 
We have an anonymous at attendee. It feels like whenever the question is about race, people get anonymous all of a sudden, but that's okay. Um, it says, you know, I'm, inter I'm interested in the narrative uh, that white people will become the minority in the United States. Dr. Rebecca Wanzo, who is a critical race theorist, theorist and a feminist theorist, teaches about the expansion of whiteness. That over time, the idea of whiteness has expanded to include additional groups not originally considered white, Italian Americans, Jewish Americans, you can add Irish uh, as well, Catholics generally as well, in order to maintain white supremacy. How do you think this historical trend will impact the current idea that white individuals will become part of the minority? Do you think that trend will hold? I would love uh, Virginia or Cad if you've got any thoughts on that. If not, I've, I've got a ton, but I would love to hear from you guys. So um, I, I think what is different now than um, than in prior generations, and and I, I this is more something that I'm curious about, which is in this country we often talk about black and white, and um, the growth in multiracial families and the ways in which people affiliate with different groups that are not their own that to me that's sort of that that is what is prompting me to think how is this going to play out because there's this dominant narrative about black and white and there's a historical reason why that is so dominant and yet the demographics are shifting in all sorts of ways um in ways we haven't seen before so that's you know that gets to change is inevitable and change may be scary for some because what we used to think about were the lines and the groups and how they were affiliated is not holding in the same way given some of those demographic shifts. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think one of the things, you know, when you look at a lot of groups, um, people who come and how they identify even through the census, there's been this huge shift in how people identify. Um, my family from Puerto Rico, it's really interesting because Puerto Ricans are one of the only uh uh, are one of the only groups of people from Latin America who tend to leave the island, identify as white on the island, but end up becoming black when they come to the U.S., which is very interesting. Um, there's a census data all around this, and there was a lot of research that was done around it um, because of from a socioeconomic standpoint and from a cultural standpoint, tend to identify more with the black community. Mm -hmm. Whereas Cubans, for example, tend to identify more with the white community. So it's very fascinating how people personally identify. But even as somebody who comes from a, a mixed race family with like mixed race children, I mean, we're all over the place. Um, it's very interesting, even with my own children, how they identify. Um, and one of my children uh, who is Ben's complexion is somebody who sees himself as um, mixed race. My other child, who is a darker brown complexion, identifies fully as a black person. And it is not for me to tell my child how you should identify yourself as a human being. That is a decision that you have to make on your own. But I think the point here is that people feel more agency over, at this point in time, how they identify. Mm -hmm. As that white dominant framework and lens in this country has, st has started to shrink, I think it would be interesting to see what else, um, how people start to see themselves in this country, because it is no longer the dominant framework. It is a declining framework and viewpoint. Um, I think it's, it's a very fascinating question. I don't know that any of us here have the answer. I think time will tell. I can say, though, that I do, and not that you can equate race to gender. It's, it's very different. But we were having a conversation um, recently about, I think you can see a parallel with women, for example, in this moment, we were talking about how women are running um, for office. I just did a, a, a session um, earlier this week about this and how different it looks for women now running for office than it did even a few years ago, for example, with the presidential race. Um, more women who are running for office that now feel comfortable 
being able to show up as their whole and complete selves as candidates, that we don't have to dress like a man, talk like a man, and 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 show up as a man would when running for office or in certain positions, because now it's okay to be able to, there's things that have become socially acceptable culturally um, that allow women to show up differently as women than it was for women for a very, very long time. You had to look a certain way, present a certain way. Don't even think about having to bring your kids on the road or have to breastfeed or anything like that. So women being able to claim that space. And I think that ha that's happening now with people when it comes to race. And there's a huge social cultural influence that happens as well when it comes to the way that we see art, music, pop culture. Um, there's a, I think that there's something to be said about that coinciding with how people see themselves. Um, that's really interesting that we could be taking a look at too. No, absolutely. And you know, it's, um, there are other dynamics that are, that are happening in our culture. And we have another question here, which is about the exorbitant money and um, you know, has the exorbitant money used in the political races tainted pure democracy? The 2024 U.S. Senate race in Pennsylvania will involve candidates spending well over a combined $100 million, right? Which is just nuts. And and I know uh, Common Cause does a lot of work in this area, Virginia, and I'll, and I'll come back to you on that. But I, you know, I got to say, like, I've been doing a lot of research about the readjuster movement in Virginia in the 1880s. And this was a movement that for four years, maybe five or six in building it, and then leading the state of Virginia, um, combined the forces of uh, working class whites and working class blacks, uh, former Confederate soldiers and their neighbors and you know descendants and formerly enslaved men and their neighbors and descendants of the one party took over the state government for four years and then was torn out of the history books because it contained every argument against Jim Crow. People got along, they dropped the state from a deficit to a surplus, they established great educational institutions, saved the free public schools, et cetera, and in how they were destroyed. And they were destroyed by disinformation that was funded by a wealthy set of conservatives who were threatened by this movement, in part because the movement taxed them, and that's how they drove the state uh, to a certain tax the old plantation owners. But by disinformation, a call to white supremacy, and the violence that those two things spawned. And one thing that's interesting is that race is fraying around the edges. I mean, if you look in you know, Trump's movement, you will see more people of color than you expect. You will look at his polls and see more people of color than you expect, both more blacks you expect, more Latinos than you expect, more Asian Americans than you expect. Um, and I live in Trump country and you know, our country club, if you, if you will, is the local YMCA. You go to the YMCA pool, there's a lot of working class white families, you know, raising black grandkids. And that, somebody whose parents was against the, marriage was against the law in this state not even 50 years ago. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the normalizing, if you will, of multiracial families amongst working class conservatives. Uh, it's also happening in the churches. But I think what's permanent to answer the question from the viewer is the commitment of folks to divide people however they can. And if they can divide them on race, they'll do that. If they can divide them on gender, they'll do that. If they can divide them on class, if they can find you know, on religion, whatever it is, they've got to keep dividing folks in order uh, to create a political situation that benefits the very rich uh, and the policies that, that they want to maintain. And I think that's perhaps even more permanent than race and in many ways the 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 biggest threat uh is folks who want to contort the dynamics of our democracy to pit americans against each other uh, from uniting in the interests of, of all their kids um but uh virginia mentioned power and you're absolutely right ben divide and conquer that is a <laughs> well-worn path to power <laughs> And, and, and when people's power is organized money and the threat to them is organized people, they will spend their money in ways to divide those people, right? And that's, and race is, is a tried and true way, but it's not the only way. Um, I mean, heck, I run the Sierra Club and we now have conservative activists dressing up as dolphins and picketing us, right? Like people will pick 
anything. And you think you've dealt with the dolphin question, and then, then they've got people concerned that uh, uh, wind that uh, wind turbines are scaring away the earthworms. Like, you know, so they will literally pick anything when we're debating over earthworms. But um, Virginia, just to come back to you before going to Kat on the money question, talk for a second about what Common Cause is doing to kind of get money out of politics and and the opportunities that you see, and then we'll come back to Kat and talk about just what philanthropy can do generally on that. Yeah, so I mean, Citizens United was obviously, and there are other, there have been other attacks on um, trying to limit the, the amount of money in politics. And so we're working closely with folks up on the Hill. We do a lot of campaign finance work at the state level, and really just trying to figure out how we can um, limit the influence of money on politics. But it's not just about political spending on races. And I just I, I want to say that because I think we tend to think of money in politics just as around campaigns. Um, and it truly is a problem. I mean, in my state of Maryland, David Trone spent well over 60 million dollars of his own money um, to try to become the uh, candidate for U.S. Senate. And in that race, um, Angela Alsobrooks was able to beat him through a ground game, right? Good old fashioned organizing. So it goes to show that money doesn't always uh, win you. Um, sometimes it's the old school tactics of just getting in on the ground. Um, but it is a problem, right? Because not everybody has a disproportionate amount of money to be able to run for office, especially women who, you know, I'll always go back to the challenges that women have raising money is much, much harder as a candidate um, traditionally than it has been for men. And so when you have the ability to self-fund, that is a problem. Being able to uh, attempt to buy your seat in office is a problem, but it goes beyond candidates. Um, so there's there's a whole issue with like who's who's getting elected, how they're getting elected, the amount of money. It's the amount of outside money also that is coming in that is problematic. And so um, we talk about certain individuals, and I don't want to get too partisan here in this conversation. I don't know what my limits are, but I have serious concerns. Um, for example, with the Supreme Court. And that is one where there is a, an influence um, when you look at the amount of gifts that are being received that have been received by Clarence Thomas, for example. Over 20, more than $20 million over the course of 24 years. Well, let's think about that. There are gifts, there's private flights, there are all of these things by his dear friend Harlan Crow. Well, then you have he, Harlan Crow, who is then putting cases in front of the Supreme Court. And he is influencing. How do you say to your friend? It's very hard to say, well, there is no conflict of interest in that situation. Harlan Crow is also funding a lot of people's campaigns through these dark money packs. There is money that is going in. So some of the electeds who are then pushing back, and it's not just a Harlan Crow, there are many other individuals. So there is, um, and, and they're focusing on very specific issues. So when you think about the um, Leonard Leos of this world, when you think about the Harlan Crows of this world, when you think about individuals who have a disproportionate amount of financial influence, both because they have friends who are on the courts who have lifetime appointments, and then you have people whose races that they can really deeply, deeply influence. I mean, and this goes far beyond just, again, the candidate races, but it goes into ballot initiatives, trying to defeat ballot initiatives, citizen-led ballot initiatives. Um, we're talking about general policy um, and the influence of the platform. We've heard so much discussion about Project 2025. Well, guess who also helps to support and fund the Heritage Foundation? who sits on the board of the Heritage Foundation, the same individuals who are putting together the platform for Project 2025. And this is not just limited to um, the right. I wanna be very fair. This happens on both sides of the aisle. And so what it does is it creates an uneven playing field for regular people. And it, what it happens is that people don't feel like their voice is being heard because it's just either special interests or the very uber wealthy who are making decisions for our lives. And so even when you're trying to vote for a candidate who you think is going to represent your interest, let me tell you something. If you are somebody 
who has a distinct political opinion. We saw this most recently um, in, in some of the uh, congressional races, Jamal Bowman. We saw it with Cori Bush in um, losing uh, their, their races and their primaries. Um, there were very specific interests who ran against them, who had a lot of money to pour into those races. So it's not just happening on one side of the aisle or the other. And so what it does is it really removes the choice from voters to be able to really have um, a fair chance at being able to look at the issues in a way. That, yeah. Like, so the solution is getting some real, real, real money out of politics. And that is huge campaign finance reforms. It's about ethics reform. It's about limiting the amount of spending. And it's about getting dark money out of politics. And so those are all the issues that we're focusing on on doing that. The um, and, and Kat, you know, in, in addition to supporting groups like Common Cause and People for the American Way, who I used to lead, folks who spend a lot of time working on getting money out of politics, what are the trends that you're seeing amongst philanthropists who want to, you know, build our democracy, strengthen our democracy? What are the smart investments that they're making? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of them, um, and so and and. Um, Focus, there are philanthropic funders focused on each of the five components of a strong democracy that I mentioned at the start of the hour. Um, I think it might help because it picks up on things that both you and Virginia have said to, to like one very concrete example, which is um, lots of things have gotten us to where we are now, where we're all feeling the pressure on democracy and trust and truth. And it's economic policy that has resulted in a um, growing wealth disparity. Um, there are um, uh, activism and um, political efforts that have rolled back things like access to reproductive health. And there have been um, technological um, and, and broader economic pressures that have resulted in the fact that very few individuals actually have access to timely, relevant, trusted information about them. In the United States, across this country, thousands of communities have low, no local source of news and information. And it's very hard to hold people accountable who are in public office. It's very hard to know sort of what people are prioritizing and what they aren't, right? if you don't have access to local news and information. And actually, the other thing that we know is that on a local level, on the national level, there's lots of incentives to go to the edges, to go to the extremes. At the local level, when we actually have to live with each other, when our kids have to go to school, when we might have to work side by side, there's much more incentive to try to figure things out. And so the lack of local news and information to make sure that we're all hearing similar facts, stories that are relevant to our day-to-day -day lives, that is a huge miss. It's undermining our, philan our, our democracy. And there are some really exciting um, philanthropic work being done there, literally re rebuilding local news and journalism. And I'll give a quick example because one of the pioneers is here in Philadelphia, Resolve Philly. It's, it's a nonprofit newsroom um, that is doing three things that the mainstream newsrooms, because their economic models have been disrupted by social media and the internet, Resolve is doing three things that are helping to rebuild democracy. Um, they have SMS texts where they are delivering um, real time, accurate news and information about elections. That's number one. Number two, they are actually engaging citizen documenters getting people in Philadelphia to go to those public hearings, in some cases, making sure they have the resources financially to do so, so they can report to their fellow, their neighbors about what's actually being talked about, um, which representative is saying what and why. And then, uh, th and this is a big shift in journalism, a focus on solutions journalism. We all know what gets to the top of the headlines, the sensational tragedies but there's great stuff that we're all doing that are actually making a difference and elevating those not in a kind of saccharine, oh, look at that cute story, but in a ways that help us remember 
that we can solve things, right? We individuals in communities, in cities, in states can solve things. And we're not, uh, you know, it, it's part of what gives people that sense of agency that you mentioned earlier. And because this is a new model, it has to be philanthropically funded. No, and it's, you know, it's really, I, geez, a decade ago, served on the Knight Commission for Information Needs of Communities and Democracy. Yeah, and, yeah. and the Knight Foundation was kind of predicting where we are now, which is that a lot of local journalism is going to have to be supported by philanthropy if it's going to happen. It's just the economic model fell apart uh, for local papers. And... Um, we keep waiting for something to emerge and it's just not happening. In the meantime, as you put it, I mean, if their information needs aren't filled, uh, democracy withers like right before our eyes. The, um, you guys talk about sort of any additional threats we haven't mentioned to, to uh, democracy that you're worried about, any additional sort of fixes uh, you know, to those threats that we haven't discussed. I'm just curious, Virginia and Kat, kind of what else we should be talking about? I mean, I, I would reinforce something that Virginia has mentioned a couple times, which is um, it can be too easy to think of democracy as, well, it's all about voting or it's all about campaigns. When actually by the time there's an election or there's a big campaign, it, in many ways, um, that is the result are going to be the result of either our investments in democracy beforehand or the fact that we haven't invested in them beforehand. So I, I think one thread is re, reframing people's understanding of democracy to be much broader in the ways that we've talked about today. It's it's about um, uh, daily involvement with our neighbors. It's about um, having and being able to consume access to news and information. It's about knowing um, who is setting policy and coming together to influence that. Um, and that's, that's sort of, that's all year round, everyday work. And the results of it show up with elections, big elections, show up with um, high profile campaigns. But, um, you know, it, the, the strengthening democracy, um, the only way to do that is to, to, to think about those five components that I mentioned earlier and pick one that, you know what, I'm, this one is the one I'm going to pay attention to more. Pat, any, I mean, um, thank you, Kat. Uh, uh, Virginia, is there anything that you want to add on there? If not, I'm going to go to a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, one of the things, I actually, as we go to the questions, I was typing a response because I saw in the questions somebody had said that um, Hillary Clinton actually had um, raised more money. They were talking about women candidates running, and they asked, uh, anonymous asked if I was being honest in my response. Um or open in my response. And I want to say, yes, absolutely. Hillary Clinton was an exception. She was not the rule when it comes to women candidates. In fact, in 2018, the midterm following the 2016 election, women candidates uh, for Congress in on average raised $500,000 less than counterparts. Women continue to bring in less money as candidates. So you will see these exceptions from time to time when there is a huge enthusiasm uh, opportunity. People get very excited behind a candidate. That is the that is the exception. That is not the rule for women candidates in general. And so I just wanted to name that in that moment, like now, because I think it's an important thing to address. And you may see the same thing with Kamala Harris. People are very excited about her candidacy. Um, that often is also a top of top of the ticket situation, mm -hmm. um, which was certainly not the case, for example, for Shirley Chisholm many uh, when she ran for office. And so I, I will say that um, sometimes there are these exceptions, superstar candidates that people really get excited about and want to invest in. But on average, women are not invested in the same way that men are. Just wanted to name that. Sorry. Yeah. No, I didn't know. No. And that's real. And that's real. And it's... Um... We need more women in office. When you look at uh, 
kind of down ballot. I think it's about like 15% of those offices are held by women across the country, even though they're 50% of the country or a little more. Um, the uh, Blair Glencourse has a question. She's, uh, Blair says, I like the reframing of, of democracy and would be interested in how our speakers see words like freedom and rights resonating these days on the left in particular. The democracy framing domestically and internationally feels like, it feels rather, feels limiting and too loaded at times. And while you guys think about response to that, I want to add in another question um, kind of related, which is about, uh, are there any in fact impactful philanthropies or think tanks who are dealing with dark money coming from foreign nations like Russia, Russia, Qatar, China, and Iran. I know um, I've had many conversations with my daughter about ads on TikTok and other places that look like it's coming from outside our democracy trying to influence it. So um, generally those words, rights, freedom, how do you see them resonating? What do you see as the trends there? And while you're talking about freedom, um, foreign powers also have the freedom uh, in a country with whose free speech is as, as, as wi widely defined as ours to influence uh, conversations. And do you see anybody really pushing back on that? Yeah, well, two things. One is shout out to Blair and his organization, Accountability Lab, focuses on some of our best public servants and how we hold governments accountable um, you know, municipally in the U.S. Uh, in states across um, the globe. So um, he's an alum of of, uh, of Chip. The question around language, um, I think, um, who doesn't want freedom? Who doesn't want rights? Right. That where things get sticky is freedom to do what, rights for whom, on what, and I think that's where the political debate comes in. Um, that's where there are disagreements. And of course, there are going to be disagreements because we're a democracy, right? Like the messiness is is central <laughs> to this um, idea of government um, of the people for the people. Um, and I, to me, that's also why um, these conversations are so much more productive um, at the smaller, smaller is a number of people and local level, because you can start teasing out where the disagreements are around freedom to do what and how, around rights um, uh, for what. Um, I mean, that's that's the challenge. And it's sort of like there's the rhetoric, rhetoric and we, you know, many commentators actually noted this in the recent Democratic convention. Wow. There's a lot of talk about freedom, a word that was um, more typically associated as a rallying call for the Republican convention. So I think, you know, I think everybody wants freedom. I think everybody wants to make sure that sort of um, core rights are reinforced. It's when you start getting to the next level, freedom to do what, rights for whom and on what, um, that, um, that we need a more sort of deliberative um, and productive conversations. Yeah, I would agree with you, Kat. And I think it's really interesting because um, the questions around freedom and rights, but yet we pledge allegiance to a flag and we talk about liberty and justice for all. And I don't know how there's a huge difference in the meaning of those words that's, that, that being able to pledge allegiance to this flag with liberty and justice for all is something that is commonplace for us as part of our, you know, uh, citizenship, right? And, and our, our ability to, to, to love this country, but using words like freedom or rights are somehow triggering. And I think there's, um, when we talk about just what it means to be a democracy, it's also just what are the shared common values that we hold as people? What is our common goal or common cause, for lack of a better term, um, how do we see how we want to be able to live in this country? And I think that most people, if you ask them, they, they'll probably have the same answer. 
we just see ourselves getting there in different ways. And so I think the more that we can define what that common purpose is for us all living here, coexisting, cohabitating in this nation, it comes down to we want the freedom to live without fear, to be able to educate our children, to be able to, to live a life without worrying about discrimination or not being able to ha have a, a decent home to live in, um, our safety is protected. There, These are all of these things that we all want um, to be able to choose whether we worship, how we worship or not at all. Um, you know, being able to have a clean environment. There are some things that when we talk about freedoms, I think we, we often need to um, go a step further, like you said, Kat, and be able to explain what that means and then how do we get to that? Um, and so some of the stuff that we've been talking about, money, the disproportionate influence that some people have, um, some of the things that we fight over when we get to that next layer, but we haven't always talked about what are the things that do hold us together and what are those common bonds and that greater good that we're seeking for not only ourselves, but our neighbors. Yeah, that's so right. We also have a question here about uh, philanthropy for active civic engagement, asking if we were members. Um, Kat, do you want to talk at all about just sort of resources for people working in philanthropy? And civic sure. Engagement? Um, so PACE, um, um, uh, which is the organization that um, Ben just mentioned and that uh, and a participant, they were a great partner to our team when we developed We the People, How Philanthropy Can Strengthen Democracy, which is a framework and a set of resources um, on how anyone, I mean, whether you're a billionaire or you have five dollars, how you can use philanthropic funds to support a stronger democracy. So um, PACE is a great organization. Uh, you know, I said earlier, um, we all have strength in numbers. So that's a group of folks, of funders, who are collectively working for uh, more active and productive civic engagement. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll say in philanthropy, one of the things that is a, um, a fairly recent development is the um, really big rise in giving circles. Um, so a, a lot of what, when you have a um, wealth disparity and when you don't have as many people um, in the sort of medium to low income and participating philanthropically, what do you do? Well, let's band together and learn from each other and select philanthropic investments that are informed by all of our perspectives. So I think there is a, a push um, to be more democratic in how people practice philanthropy. No, that's, I think that's a good note to end on. We're at 12.57, it's time to bring back on our Dean. Uh, we don't always start on time, but we do always end on time. I want to take a moment just to thank everybody who's joined us for this kind of lunch and learn that we do periodically. It's been a joy to be a part of this community. And we did see some technological suggestions and we'll take those to heart and we'll think on those. Sally? Wow, that was just fantastic. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and I wanna thank you, Ben, Kat, Virginia for this wonderful enlightening discussion, which uh, represents what we're doing here at SB2 and reflects our dedication to exploring root causes of inequity, uh, inequality, and how we can promote well-being for all. We are steadfast in our commitment to social innovation, impact, and justice. We have five degree programs. We have lots of interactions with colleagues, students, community members, alumni, external partners. And so we're thrilled to be able to be a part of this uh, journey today. I wanna thank you all for joining us. Our next installment of our speaker series is gonna focus on health and it's going to be held December 3rd. Uh, ben will be our host again. Please stay tuned for more information, which we will share um, when we get closer to that date. Thank you. Take care and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dean Buckley.